Uh, welcome to the uh, New York uh, Author Series at Google. Um, uh, we're, we're pleased to welcome Gavin Praetor Penny. Yeah, said it right. Um, the founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Um, it's an online community for cloud lovers to post pictures, learn facts, uh, and discover the be best places in the world to go for cloud spotting. Um, the CAS won uh, the 2005 Yahoo, sorry, uh, Weird and Wonderful Award. So if we get a Weird and Wonderful Award, that can win it as well. Um, uh, Gavin is a, a former science nerd and graduate of Oxford University. Um, he's been obsessed with cloud since childhood. Uh, he's a journalist and co-founder of the Idler magazine. Um, his writings appeared in the, telegra the Telegraph, The Evening Standard, Harper's, Queen, and other British publications. Um, he currently lives in London, and he has a couple of books out, which I think uh, most of you are holding, The Cloud Spotter's Guide and uh, The Flying Saucers photo book. So Authors at Google is proud to announce, and please help me welcome Gavin Preterpenny. Great, thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, I thought what I'd do really would be keep it quite simple and just show you some nice pictures of clouds <laughs> and say why I like them. Uh, but I thought before I did that, maybe I should explain what the Cloud Appreciation Society is and how that came about, because um, I guess it's sort of an odd sounding idea. Um, a friend of mine was running a, a literary festival in Cornwall, down in the southwest of England, and uh, she asked if I'd like to do a talk about clouds, because she knew that I loved them. Uh, and I said, yes, of course. Um, but I got a bit worried in the weeks running up to the talk, because it occurred to me, people always complain about clouds. They moan about them. and. It seemed to me, anyway, there would be a big danger of no one coming along to the talk. This is before I started the society, before I did any books about clouds. I thought the one way to be sure people would come to a talk about clouds is to give it a really weird name. So I called it the inaugural lecture of the Cloud Appreciation Society, just to make it sound kind of weird and intriguing. And it worked in the sense that everyone came along. It was all full. Problem was. Everyone came up to me afterwards and said, how do I join your society? <laughs> uh, and so I thought, actually, maybe I should just start one. Maybe I should start a real society and, and put up a website. So I did that. I put up a website. When you, when you join the society, you get a badge. I think we, they call it a pin here. Um, and yeah, I thought it's important to have a badge so that you can wear that with pride. Uh, very important also to have a number. Uh, so when you become a member, you get a certificate with your number on it. It says, uh, the Cloud Appreciation Society, we do hereby certify that bleep, the person's name was elected as a member of this society on the date and will henceforth seek to persuade all who listen on the wonder and beauty of clouds. So there's a kind of campaigning element to this. Uh, and I hope to convince you um, a little bit about the wonder and beauty of clouds in, the, in this talk. Um, a lot of the, well, firstly, I should just say this, once they put this on the web, it expanded in the way that things can when they go on the web. They to just take on this sort of viral uh, growth, which just goes by itself. And, uh, it, you know, it's spread and spread. We now got 10,500 members in uh, 48 countries around the world. Um, and uh, a lot of the photos I'm showing, or well, all the photos I'm showing are photos that have been sent in uh, to the website by members and visitors, because that's one of the things I encourage is people to send in photographs. They go up on the website's gallery pages. And another thing I really encourage is people to send in the clouds that look like things because that's one of the really important parts of cloud spotting, is finding shapes in the sky. Um, so I've got a bit of an emphasis, because this book, the, um, this book Hot Pink Flying Saucers and Other Clouds, is a, a little collection of our favorites of the clouds that look like things. And so I put a bit of emphasis on the ones I'm showing, um, of the ones that look like stuff, because they're kind of funny. 
Um, in, the, in the UK, it's called a pig with six legs and other clouds. They chose a different picture for the cover. Um, so, yes. Uh, when, well, what, why don't we just go through some clouds? I'll just tell you about some of the ones I like. Um, good one to start with is this one, I think. This fluffy little fellow. I don't know if we've got any cloud spotters in the audience here and whether anyone here knows what type of cloud, it's a Latin name, what type of cloud this is. It's a very common cloud you see a lot on a sunny day. Anyone got any ideas? Who said that? Cumulus. You're completely right. Here you go. Badge for you, sir. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's a cumulus cloud. Uh, that's just the Latin. Now, these Latin names sound a bit kind of, uh, well, they sort of put you off a little bit, but it's just a Latin for st stacked, hump, clamped, clumped, or heaped. Uh, it's just the way these look, and they are, you know, they're, they're very sort of friendly. They're fair weather clouds. They form when it's sunny. Cumulus cloud, never hurt a soul. Uh, I'm, rather, I'm rather fond of them because they, they, they seem to me like the generic cloud, if you were to close your eyes and imagine a cloud, it would probably be a cumulus. And sometimes they're small. When they're small, they're called cumulus humilis, meaning just humble in Latin, the little ones. Um, one of the things I like about, besides these are the kind of being but the basic clouds, I like the way that whenever kids do a drawing of a, like a house, you know, um, with a family next to it, they always put cumulus clouds in the sky, these puffy kind of clumps of cloud. And I think that no, um, no picture of a house with front door and a, a chimney, a levitating family, <laughs> none of those are complete without some cumulus clouds in the sky. So that's why I like them as well. Um, they also look like the most comfortable of clouds. You know, these would be good ones to lie on. Uh, when I was young, I used to think, what would it be like to sort of lie on a cloud? It must be like the kind of softest thing imaginable. Um, and I think it's the fact that they look comfortable like this. They look so kind of inviting, which is why, it must be the reason why it's always cumulus clouds that seem to appear in religious imagery. Like when I was living in Rome, I lived in Rome for seven months, and I got this... Uh, prayer card from the street and it was a prayer for the souls in purgatory and you can see um, there's the, the souls in the flames of purgatory down below and then Jesus, Joseph and Mary up there looking rather pleased with themselves on their nice comfy, these are like the sofas of the saints, these clouds. So I like that kind of symbolic role for them as dividers between the kind of divine world and that of us sort of mortal sinners below. Um, this one uh, has some cumulus clouds that look like a, uh, um, a cowboy, how they were sent in. Um, I can't actually see the pictures that are coming up, so they're as much as a surprise to me as they are to you. Um, oh yeah, the Michelin man robbing a bank. <laughs> An elephant sneezing. So cumulus clouds are good ones for finding shapes because uh, they're quite, they've got sharp edges to them. So they've got clear, defined kind of profiles. Um, and so they are, and also they, the shapes change quite quickly because uh, these clouds uh, are in constant motion. And so they, you, know, you can find a lot of shapes. If you're lying on your back in the park, Staring up at uh, some clouds, these are good ones to stare up at if you want to find shapes. Um, that's Santa Claus delivering some presents. Um, I guess he's got a slightly odd bunch uh, of reindeer. <laughs> but I thought I'd put a kind of topical one in there. Um, now, when they're medium-sized, cumulus clouds are called mediocris. It's just the Latin for, for sort of medium. And uh, it's quite interesting when you hear that one of these clouds, if you were to add together all the droplets of water in one of these clouds, they would weigh the same as 80 elephants. So it's quite a lot 
of water there, and it's quite heavy. And it occurred to me when I first heard it, how does it all get up there? How does all that water get up in the air and stay up in the air? What makes it happen? And I realized that one way of explaining it is to talk about lava lamps. When you've got a lava lamp, you have the light at the bottom of the lamp, and that warms the oil, which is there sort of not mixing with the water. You've got the oil, the lamp warms it, it expands a little bit, and it becomes a bit less dense than the water, and it floats upwards through the water. And then when it gets up near the top, it cools again, it shrinks again, it becomes a bit more dense and sinks back down. And it's this kind of movement of the oil is known as convection current. And a little bit of a similar thing happens outside on a sunny day because it's air, not liquids. Well, it's gas, it's not liquids, but um, the sun warms the ground. And some bits of the ground heat the air above it quicker than others. So this so a field like that, plowed field, will warm up the air above faster than a bit of woodland. And for that reason, the air above that field expands a little bit and kind of rises up in a bubble. And it's a little bit like a kind of invisible man rising up off the ground. And when it gets to a certain height, it can cool enough for the moisture in it to form into little droplets of water, which is what the cloud's made up with. It's a little, it's a little bit like a kind of white toupee and magically appearing on this invisible man's head. And then in the wind, in the kind of summer's breeze, because this is why they're, summer, they're, they're, they're sunny weather clouds. In the summer breeze, you can, this, this toupee can be kind of plucked off and can blow along in the wind. Uh, it's one of the most pleasurable parts of, of a lovely summer's day is just watching the clouds drift along like enormous sheep in the breeze. Um, Sometimes these, these clouds line up in streets, they're called, um, yeah, cloud streets, they're called, and they are um, like the Roman roads of the sky. Um, and sometimes they are uh, tall. When they're tall, they're known as cumulus congestus clouds. Um, and it's this cloud type which was the cloud that appeared in the first example of cloud pornography. It was by Correggio, uh, 1530, somewhere around there. And it's called Jupiter and Io. And it's one of a series of three paintings about Jupiter and about how he would, well, it's about the loves of Jupiter. And this is when Jupiter came down to seduce Io, who was one of his wife's priestesses. She's a mortal, and he came down to seduce her, and he was a bit worried that his wife would catch him at it, so he thought the thing to do is to hide myself as a, in a cloud, to disguise myself as a cloud, and you can see his face just kind of emerging from the kind of dark cloud, and his puffy hand around uh, Eo's waist. Clearly, Eo is an early cloud spotter. <laughs> and you can see um, that I think of him as a kind of cumulus congestus cloud because he's dark. And these clouds, because they're tall, when you're underneath one, a lot of the sunlight gets scattered out and gets blocked from reaching you. And so they look dark on the base. So, yeah, there it is, cumulus congestus cloud. First example, sadly the last example of cloud pornography. Um, dog barking uh, is an example of uh, cumulus congestus cloud at work. Um, this one, one of my, uh, is one of my favorites. Um, oh, and this one isn't one of my favorites. I like this one, though. It's a, it's a bear trained in the cruel art of duck juggling. <laughs> Banned in many parts of the world. Um, some people find that rather upsetting. I hope I haven't. Um, upset anyone. Uh, yes, no, it's a different cloud I'm going to show with my favorite one. Um, so I'm on to the next type of cloud that I like. And um, I don't expect anyone to really 
necessarily recognize this one. Um, but if, if anyone happens to know it, stick your hand up. Who said that? N nice try. <laughs> but no cigar or badge. Um, but um, uh, it could be, but it's not. Uh, it's actually stratocumulus, that cloud. It's like a cumulus, but it's when they've joined out into a layer. So it's a sort of stratus. It's like a layer of cumulus clouds. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say too much about these other than you know, just show you a few pictures. Um, there you go, stratocumulus. So sometimes clouds express themselves in the negative. This is blue zombie. You see what I mean? A hole going on. So a hole in a stratocumulus layer can, uh, can cause a shape. Um, the Grim Reaper on the horizon, obviously photographed from a plane, would be feeling perhaps a little bit nervous if you looked out the window and saw the Grim Reaper on the horizon. Um, this is a, uh, a fox on stage. Um, I don't know if you can see that really. It's like um, there's his two ears, his mouth. He's kind of facing that way, barking uh, some sort of song to the audience, and he's being lit by the floodlights up there. And you're kind of looking from the side of the stage. Anyway, that's how I see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and this one's... Um, Anyone, can anyone uh, recognize that? Salvador Dali, did you say? Yeah, absolutely right, Salvador Dali. Some people say Billy Connolly, but I prefer Salvador Dali. Extremely right. Yeah, and you should get a, you should get a pin for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, Salvador Dali. That's one of my favorites. I just like the detail of his, of his mustache. Do you know what I mean? Curling there, and it's all in the details of these things, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, on to the next type of cloud. Um, anyone recognize that? He said what? Oh, nice try. You might be interested in having a go at this one. Yes. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to but bump the prize up a little bit. Oh, no. uh, Iron-on embroidered patch. <laughs> to put that on your, um, you can put it on the elbow of your jacket. <laughs> All right, something like that. Yeah, wherever. Um, your cumulonimbus cloud. So these ones I like because they're really, so these are sort of the exciting ones. Is it, do people remember top trumps? Did you get those in the States? Those card, that card game. No. Okay. Well, it's. I won't do that one then. Um, but it, th this is like if this is sort of the the scary cloud. Really, they're enormous for starters. So they will reach ten, twelve miles up into the sky. One of these is estimated as containing the power of ten nuclear bombs. And they're where thunder and lightning and hailstones are are created. Um, and they often have this very distinctive anvil shape. And so the name for that in Latin is incus, which is just the Latin for an anvil, blacksmith's anvil. Um, and that's because they grow so high, they get to a stage, they get to a point in the atmosphere where the temperature changes and it's like a ceiling, like an invisible ceiling to cloud growth. And the cloud can't grow any higher to get through that and it just expands, it spreads outwards, like kind of smoking a pipe in a greenhouse. It just kind of spreads out at the top. Um, sometimes they line up in storm fronts like this. So it's photographed from an aeroplane. Um, and then you know, there's, it, it's worth saying that one thing that pilots do, one thing they don't do is fly through these clouds. They do everything they can to avoid flying through a cumulonimbus storm cloud. Um, but there was, there was one guy who was an American who in 1959, he didn't fly through one. He was flying over the top of one in his jet. He was just on a routine flight, flying over the top of one. And he had a bit of a problem with his plane. And he ended up falling through the cumulonimbus cloud. And it was not a very nice, it was not a very good day for him. Put it this way. Um, firstly, he heard this big boom in the back of his plane, like a sort of 
a sort of terrible sound that he knew something very bad had happened. And all his controls went like that, all his dials. Um, and he thought, right, OK, the engine sees something disastrous, something catastrophic has happened. I'm going to have to engage the electricity supply so I can get the controls back. Uh, and he, so he pulled on the emergency electricity dis supply deployment lever um, beside him. And it came off in his hand. So he thought, right, I've got, no, I've got no option but to eject. But the problem was he was up at 47,000 feet, which is up you know, for, as a high altitude for cruising uh, jets. And he was only wearing a summer flying suit. He had no, um, you know, no one has survived from ejecting at that height unless they've been in a, in a pressure suit. And he was just in a summer flying suit. And he, but he, he had no choice in the matter. It was either going to be, he was in a, like a, it was just going to fall to the ground. So he, was, he pulled his cords and came flying out of the cockpit. And the first thing he experienced uh, was the temperature. It was minus 51 degrees centigrade. Um, excruciatingly cold, the pain of feeling that. And then the pressure change, as he came out of the pressurized cockpit into 47,000 feet air pressure, there was this terrible expansion of his body. He was spinning and flailing around, to sort of disorientated, but he had some uh, oxygen on his face. He had like an emergency oxygen supply. So he kind of, he stayed conscious. And as he was spinning, he looked down and he looked at his body and he, he, he looked like he was in a stage of advanced pregnancy from his body expanding in this, this low temperature, having come from <laughs> inside the... Um, inside the cockpit. So he, you know, had a very bad start to the journey, but it actually got worse because um, he was falling down and he started to fall into the top of this cumulonimbus cloud, the icy top. It's made out of ice crystals up at the top there. So it's kind of a wispy, it's a wispy effect. And he started falling down into this and it began to get darker and darker because as he went into the center of the cloud, it became more and more, there was less and less light was able to be getting in there. It's all scattered away. It began to get darker and darker. He began to get less and less visibility. And he had a parachute which had an automatic deployment sort of set up on it. So when you get to the right height, the parachute opens. You don't have to pull the cord. Um, so he was spinning around in there and he was thinking, God, is this parachute going to open? I don't even know. I'm having such a bad day. It might not even. But then it did, and he could feel it, and it felt the tension in the rises going up, and he thought, right, okay, parachute's opened, everything's looking all right now, it's good. It's, things are looking up. But that was just as he was getting into the middle of the cloud, and one of the characteristics of these clouds is that in the center they have these extremely violent uh, vertical currents of air going up and down. And he described afterwards the, I've got it written down here, he described afterwards the experience of, of first kind of reaching this air current uh, blasting upwards. Uh, he said, it came with incredible suddenness and fury. It hit me like a tidal wave of air. A massive blast fired at me with the savagery of a cannon. I went soaring up, up, and up as though there would be no end to its force. And then the, the, the hailstones started, and he started getting pummeled by these hailstones. And there was so much water as well that was around that he felt in danger of drowning because he'd now got his mask off. The, the oxygen had run out, but he could breathe because he got low enough. But he was in danger of drowning, and he vomited um, and was bleeding from his ears. It was all to do with this, uh, the pressure changes. Uh, and being hit by these hailstones, he said, this was, he said, this was nature's bedlam, um, a black, ugly cage of screaming, violent, fanatical lunatics beating me with flat, big, flat sticks, roaring at me, screeching, trying to crush me or rip me with their hands. And the thunder and the lightning started, and he said the feeling of the lightning was like an explosion. It wasn't a sound. It was an explosion hitting, it, hitting him. But he did emerge from the base of the cloud. Um, and the fact that he wrote that means we know that he survived. I've obviously given that away. But he came out the bottom of the cloud and managed to land in a pine forest. And 
you land in a pine forest, and it, like any good pilot, when they do an eject, when they get out of the plane, they always check their watch just before they do so, because they can get an idea of when they're likely to hit the ground if they do that. That's part of the sort of training. So he'd done that, and when he reached the ground uh, in his, in his um, parachute and landed in this forest, completely disoriented, the storm was still raging, down, now he was down below it, uh, he managed to look in this kind of dark um, light. He looked at his watch, and normally a descent like this would take 10 minutes to get down from that height. Uh, it took him 40 minutes. He was stuck in the middle of this cloud, being blown up and down. In the same way that a hailstone gets blown up and down within the cloud, a hailstone, he gets blown up and down and he gets covered in like a gobstopper, you know those sweets, it gets covered in layers of ice. Um, he, he had, this had happened to him, he was covered in bruises, the doctors were amazed that he survived. Um, covered in welts from being pummeled by these hailstones. And uh, they, there was one thing they couldn't work out and so after he, when he was in the hospital and recovering, and they couldn't work out what these lines were on his body, these red sort of geometric lines, until they finally worked out that that was where his body had expanded. It had pressed on the inside of his loose flying suit, and these were the stitching marks left behind. Um, and so he, it looks rather as if he just hurt his little finger in that picture. But the doctors, as I say, were, um, were amazed that he survived. This is like some, some time after. So you don't want to get too close to these clouds, put it that way. Um, when this one is uh, a cumulonimbus cloud, as it's died down, it is, of course, as we can all see, Thor, the mighty thunder, Norse god of thunder, holding up his thunder hammer in the air. We can all see that. And of course, as I'm sure you will all recognize, he has under his arm there, his daughter, Thrud. Um, what else do we have? Oh, yes. Um, sometimes these clouds, one thing I like about cumulonimbus clouds is the way they are um, sort of factories for other features, cloud features. This one, sent in by Mike Hollinghead, um, is of a shelf cloud, which is around the base of a very, very violent storm. You can get this sort of cloud. It's where the air that's rising up in the center also comes back down and it splays out when it hits the ground and as it does so burrowing up the air around and causing like a shelf of cloud like this. Um, you've got tuba um, which are the beginnings of water spouts and tornadoes and uh, dust devils at their mildest but um, four of those up in a row like that is not something you see very often it was something that would happen on a storm front. Um, and then mama, or mamatus clouds, are uh, another uh, favorite that are associated with these cumulonimbus clouds. Um, there's a particularly dramatic one from John Olson there, um, Nebraska. So the more dramatic, the thunder cloud. These appear often on the underside of the anvil of the cloud. And the more dramatic the thunder cloud, the more kind of buxom the mama or the mamatus clouds that are associated with it, named after the Latin for udders. Um, so yes, on to a next one. I don't think, I'm not even going to ask you, this one's too weird, people won't recognize it. Altocumulus lenticularis is the name of this cloud. I like them because they look like flying saucers. Simple as that. Um, if that's a flying saucer, then this one is the mothership, I guess. Um, and the way these clouds form, there's a kind of interesting thing i just tell you quite briefly about how these clouds form, um, because there are clues here in these two pictures, because um, these are like mountainous regions. And um, these lenticular clouds, as people call them, form in mountainous regions because it's all to do with the air reaching an obstacle like a mountain or a hill and having to go upwards to go over it. Uh, the diagram here, um, only two of those are clouds, of course. Uh, the diagram, you can see that the airflow goes up and rises to go over the peak of the mountain. And sometimes it can take on this kind of wave-like shape in the lee of the peak. 
and at the crest of each of these invisible waves of air, a lenticular cloud can form. So uh, I just say when I was living in Italy, I was very interested to go to Arezzo, and I was noticing the uh, frescoes by Piero della Francesca up on the walls, and I thought, wait a minute, He's not doing your, your average cumulus cloud like everyone else. Piero della Francesca painted lenticular clouds. You can see they're the same kind of UFO clouds in the background of his frescoes. Um, and again, there must be an early cloud spotter. And then I discovered that he grew up at the base of some mountains in the center of Italy. And probably when he was young, he would see these clouds up in the sky and they made an impression on him. At least that's how I kind of make sense of the reason why he chose to do these odd clouds. Um, yeah, so they look like UFOs. There's a good example. It's the one that's on the cover of the, um, of the book. Um, caught, but looks particularly dramatic by the way that it's caught in the light. Um, but this one's like a sort of <clears throat> cloud ship enterprise um, version. Um, final cloud type uh, before I show a little film. I've got a little film I'm going to show at the end. Um, but I wonder whether anyone knows what this cloud is. No, I'm, you've already done one. Any other ideas? Who hasn't got a badge yet? It's named after the Latin for a lock of hair. That might not mean anything. Begins with a. Who said Cirrus? Have you, have you had a badge? No, you haven't, have you? In that case, there you go. You can have the calendar. <laughs> Cloud Appreciation Society calendar. <laughs> 2008. Um, so it is indeed the cirrus cloud. And this is one of my favorites. I just find them the most beautiful of all the kind of common clouds. They're, as I say, named after the Latin for a lock of hair. Um, they actually, make, they actually consist of cascading ice crystals. So from up at the top of the part of the sky where clouds form, these clouds begin and they fall. Uh, these ice crystals fall <clears throat> and cascade downwards. And as they fall, they pass through different layers of the atmosphere, which can be moving, have different winds, and be, have, be different in terms of their temperature. And, and it means that the cloud has this wavy effect. Um, and it's... Because they consist of ice crystals, they have this more kind of translucent, see-through appearance to them. Um, sometimes they uh, look quite confused like that. That would be a cirrus in tortoise cloud. Um, they're good for movement. So this is a skateboarder doing tricks. You see that? Good kind of interaction between cloud and landform here. Um, yeah, as I say, clouds are, the cirrus clouds are good for things that are moving because they have this kind of blurry appearance to them. Um, so that one's a, a dragonfly. Um, they're also interesting when they join together and form into a, a, a layer called a cirrostratus because you get these weird optical effects. Um, this here down there is a, um, what's known as a sun dog or a mock sun, and it's all to do with how the sunlight is refracted by the tiny ice crystals that make up these clouds. There are a number of these different effects, like a, a, a halo around the sun or around the moon. It's known as a um, 22 degrees halo. Not very kind of evocative or romantic name. <laughs> this one um, is, uh, it looks to me like a, a, a cloud smile really. It's very high up in the sky around the zenith and just above where the sun is you can get an arc of colored light like this. Like a sort of upside down rainbow but high up in the sky rather than down near the ground like a rainbow is. Again, very um, well, not a very evocative or romantic name for this is the circumzenithal arc. I prefer some kind of hippie thing like cloud smile that hasn't caught on, that one. Um, then cirrocumulus are uh, lots of high little clumps of cloud known as a mackerel sky. Um, another kind of beautiful uh, appearance, I think, for, for these high clouds. Um, 
So then I'm just going to um, talk about and show you this little film about this one cloud that I went across the world to go and see. And all my friends thought I was nuts when I said, uh, I'll tell you how it happened. I, um, I was um, looking through a book, I was leafing through a book of cloud photographs, you know, as you do. And I came across one, I came across this one. Um, looks like, well, I just thought it looked cool. You know, this long tube of cloud with these sort of weird tubes before, behind it. And I read it, it said, the morning glory cloud, the fanciful name of this phenomenon conveys, sorry, the fanciful name of this phenomenon conveys the feeling of elation which its passage arouses. And I thought, that's quite cool. You know, a cloud that's named after the sort of feeling you get as it flies over you. Um, and I read on and I found it, it, it forms in Burke Town, which is this little town in the middle of northern Queensland in the outback in Australia. And I thought maybe it's rather difficult because I, I wanted to go and see this cloud. I thought it was a little bit unlikely that I could go all the way to Australia to go and see a cloud. But as I found out more about it, my kind of desire to go and see it became more sort of urgent, really, because I discovered that glider pilots congregate in this little town. As I say, it's in the middle of the outback in northern Queensland, at the top of Australia. They congregate at the time of year when this cloud tends to form. And they go up in their planes and they surf it like surfers on a wave. Because this cloud forms in a kind of wave of air that travels along about 35 miles an hour. And they get up in their planes on the front of it and can go long distances and, and high speeds surfing this cloud. And I thought, cloud surfing? That is, that is a cool idea. I quite like the idea of hanging out with these glider pilots, you know what I mean, and having beers with them, waiting for the perfect cloud, you know, be sort of version of some surf, cloud version of a surf movie. Um, and, and I managed to kind of wrangle things, doing an article, making some little TV programs for Channel 4, and I managed to get out there. Um, end of September, beginning of October is when this cloud forms. So I got there around that time and uh, was sort of, I don't know, it was a little bit of a shock when I arrived in Burketown. This is sort of downtown Burketown. <laughs> um, 178 people live there. Uh, and the flying doctor comes once a week. Um, not a lot goes on. There's a restaurant, the Morning Glory restaurant. Um, Closed for the two weeks I was there. Uh, yeah, I was there for two weeks because I wanted to be sure that, you know, I, I would be able to see this cloud. I thought well, two weeks had got to be long enough. Um, and I got up every morning very, very early because the thing about it is that it forms really early in the morning, this cloud. It arrives at dawn. Um, and I thought, well, every morning I get up. But the problem was I'm not a very good morning, but I find it quite hard to get up in the morning. Uh, and I find it pretty hard getting up at like 4, 4.30 every morning when I was there. Um, and I would go out onto the savannah. It's very, very flat in this area of, of Australia. Go out to the savannah, and I'd look off to the eastern sky where the sun was rising in the hope that I'd see the sort of first signs of this cloud arriving because um, it, it looks like a kind of dark line on the horizon as it begins. You can see it sort of arriving. Um, and I'd do this, and every morning I'd get up, and it, and it wouldn't come. It wasn't coming. There was nothing there. It was cloudless sky every day, blue sky. And I think blue skies are boring. <laughs> that I was sort of hoping for this cloud on the horizon, but it wasn't turning up. And uh, I started getting a bit sort of stressed about it, to tell you the truth. You know, there was nothing going on in this place. It was just sort of everyone hanging out, but I was aware that I couldn't really go home having gone across the world, you know, and say, but, oh, it didn't come. Sorry, no, it didn't arrive. I didn't think that would go down well. Um, so I was finding it quite difficult. And everywhere I went in the town, which is like only sort of three places to go, the, the pub, the post office, the cafe. Here in the post office, for instance, everywhere I went, it seemed to be there were these pictures up on the wall, these photos up on the wall of this cloud. It was a little bit like, you know, in a pizzeria, and they've got a picture of Robert De Niro coming in, eating the pizza. I felt like this was like this visiting dignitary that came to town, and everyone proudly put their photo, photo up on, on the wall. But it just sort of served to get me more and more kind of worked up 
uh, about the fact that he wasn't coming. And all the um, glider pilots who were there were saying, look, and their Australian accents, which I won't try and do, they were saying, look, it's quite possible, it does happen quite a lot, that gliders come here for a two-week sort of time. A cloud doesn't arrive. The morning glory cloud doesn't show up. And then they say, okay, fine, I'll stay on for an extra week. They call back home and change things. Having they're driven like thousands of miles with their glider towed behind them and their four-wheel drives. So they stay an extra week. It still doesn't show up. And then they have to go home. And then they would always say, of course, you know, the day after they leave, it would turn up. It suddenly occurred to me that this could actually happen to me. Um, and, and then someone suggested that I needed to speak to Dawn. Dawn was an old Aboriginal lady who lived on this island just off the coast, because this is on the coast of Queensland. Um, and there's a little island, Bentink Island, and they said Dawn does a dance. And it's a dance that brings the wind that carries the morning glory cloud. So you might want to try, see, you know, you might want to have to go over there and have a word and see what happened. And I was like desperate at this stage. I'm like, dawn, dance, yep, great, I'll go over there, I'll try it. And, um, uh, and so here's dawn um, on the beach. Uh, two of these, a lot of, this is in one of the other photos, the little films, not the one I'm going to show you, it's one of the other ones. So I just have to describe it. It was kind of, or I can do flick backwards and forwards. There's a lot of stamping of the feet, clapping of hands, and shouting. Um, and, the, uh, and the other ladies who were there were saying, can you, can you feel it? The wind is picking up. And I was like, well, I don't know, it's a bit of a breeze, but I guess, I don't know. Um, the next morning, of course, it didn't come again. So I was thinking, well, I've run out of options now. But the people in the town, the locals, said there are a couple of things that you should look out for which are indicators that the cloud might be coming the following day. One of them is in the pub, the one and only pub in the town. The beer fridges have glass doors, and when it's moist enough, they sort of frost up. They go frosty. Um, that's an indication that the cloud, it's, there's enough moisture in the air for the cloud to form. And the other one is the cheap cafe, the cheap tables in the cafe, they curl upwards in the corners. That again, if you see that, that's an indication that it's quite likely the cloud's going to come. So as I say, it hadn't come the next day, but later that afternoon, I went into the pub. Hello. Things are looking a bit more positive. And, uh, and in the cafe, curling up at the corner of the tables. Um, and, and it did come then. It came the next day. And we went up in a plane. I went up in a plane. I'm not a glider, so I just went up uh, with a plane and filming at the window to see the gliders doing this um, surfing of clouds. And um, I kind of interviewed them and got the, I, I got to hear their what they had to say about it, and basically um, did the little, this little film is about what it's like to surf a cloud. So, I mean, if you're ready with the, uh, with the DVD, let's just show it. These glider pilots are about to go surfing, surfing on a wave of air which forms around a cloud called the morning glory. The cloud is in the shape of an enormous tube and rolls in at first light over the coast of Queensland from Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. It offers what's got to be the most exciting gliding experience in the world. You get on it, come over the face and you can surf down, you can have a wing in the cloud and surf right down to the bottom edge. The absolute smoothness, being able to travel at high speed, the barest movements of the controls, that's completely different to how you normally fly a glider. Very often you'll get a, a very strong primary cloud which rolls along very quickly. The 
you can jump back from the, the first primary wave often to secondary and third, fourth, and extend it like that. This time's when I, I reckon I've probably done about 500 kilometres. The chances of something bad happening are, are high. So you're flying at quite low altitudes over um, remote areas and they're full of crocodiles. If a surfer were to, to go um, too far into the back end of the wave, he wipes out equally. We wipe out too, but I think with um, probably more disastrous consequences. I think you'd only have maybe a dozen people uh, in the world that really have done it. It is unique, that's for sure. The word hasn't spread much yet. It's good to share it with everybody, but I wouldn't like to see it becoming like a traffic jam. Generally 10 or 15 minutes into the flight that the sun comes across the top of the cloud. And uh, when you look back at that site with this fantastic golden sun breaking behind it, it's, uh, you'd swear that you're in heaven. It's that good. <laughs> So, um, so I don't think uh, I don't think any society is complete unless it's got a manifesto. Very important to tell people what you stand for. So I'm just going to read out and read that out to you right now, if I can find it. The manifesto of the Cloud Appreciation Society. We believe that clouds are unjustly maligned and that life would be immeasurably poorer without them. We think that clouds are nature's poetry and the most egalitarian of her displays since everyone has a good view of them. We pledge to fight blue sky thinking wherever we find it. Life would be dull if we had to look up at cloudless monotony day after day. We seek to remind people that clouds are expressions of the atmosphere's moods, and they can be read like those on a person's face. We believe that clouds are for dreamers, and their contemplation benefits the soul. Indeed, all who consider the shapes they see in them will save money on psychoanalysis bills. <laughs> and so we say to all who listen, look up, marvel at the ephemeral beauty, and always remember to live life with your head in the clouds. Thanks very much. We've got time for uh, one or two questions if uh, anybody has them. Don't worry if you haven't. Uh, yeah, okay. So you showed uh, a handful of artists that uh, you enjoy their representation of clouds. Uh, one, I was curious what your opin opinion of Turner was. Um, s s find out if you spent a lot of time in the K Tate Gallery for that. Uh, and then uh, what is your favorite art artist representation of the cloud? Mm, good question. Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I like Turner and Constable. And it's difficult to say which I prefer. They're rather different. Um, John Constable, uh, I'll talk about first, he was one of our, I think it was one of our best, best uh, one of Britain's best cloud painters. Um, and I just, I'm not too wild on the, the landscapes part of his landscapes, but the sky is where it's all happening. He described the sky as the chief organ of sentiment, the keynote in his paintings. And saw that as where all the kind of emotion, that, that was the part of the painting that was charged for him. So, and he was a very, very keen, um, where the watcher, he would write notes on the back of his paintings, uh, on the back of his canvases, uh, of the conditions when he painted them. And for a period of time, he, in the, in the 1820s, early 1820s, he just didn't bother with the ground any longer and just painted skies, the, these cloud studies. Um, and they're beautiful. They're kind of very loose compared with his, uh, his the, you know, below the horizon line. It all feels a little bit 
which is part of the kind of style then, but the sky feels very loose. Turner um, can be more difficult, different in a way. I mean, he's much more, less to do with a really clear representation of uh, exactly what the sky looked like. He was much more about the kind of emotion and the feeling of being consumed in, sub in, in the middle of a storm. And famously was, uh, you know, tied himself to the mast of a ship when he was in the middle of a storm. He was like an early storm chaser, in a way. Um, so I love him just for the kind of, the sheer sort of abstract energy of uh, a, a cat and a cloud in the sky painting. So, yeah, I mean, t the, the, I, th I think they're, they're both great cloud painters, and I, and I can't be choose between the two. My favorite. Yeah? Ah. Uh, the, the insides are the same. It's just the cover that's different. Yeah, the pig one's not in that one. Yeah, they just kind of kept, they just sort of changed. The, the UK one was done first, and then the US one was done second. And uh, I think they just found that one a more kind of dramatic cover. So they're essentially the, they're essentially the same thing. They've just got different covers. And when the pig one didn't get put on this cover, it didn't go inside. Who knows? <laughs> but they're essentially it, it's complicated though. You know, because nowadays, uh, as you all know, things are so. There's no real distinction between territories in terms of what people find online. And so it's kind of confusing to have two names of the same book and people sort of, it's something that more and more, and it's also difficult when books get released in different territories at different times um, because the Cloud Spotter's Guide, the first book, um, it's in 15 territories now or something like that, uh, in a lot of different translations, Estonian, uh, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, um, and the, uh, each of these places, it comes out at a different time. And so the publisher wants, you know, to, for the press to be talking about it when the book's out, obviously not before anyone can buy it, but people, the journalists, will find stuff online, they'll go to the society website, and they'll say, great, can I do an interview with you? And then it's sort of this tricky sort of thing, and you kind of go, yeah, but it would be great if you could just wait for a bit. So that's just sort of the nature of... Um, you know, the book industry around the world, it, you know, now that we've got this kind of breakdown of barriers. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. It's wonderful that such a thing exists. Um, so I know you can see pretty amazing clouds almost anywhere, but what are some of your favorite geographic locations for amazing cloud spotting? Well, um, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I mean, the first point I would make is that, in a way, I sort of almost don't want to sort of say you should go here rather than there, because that's kind of the point of it. I mean, like somewhere like New York, all right, is not an ideal place to go cloud spotting, because you look up and you get sort of strips, you know what I mean, between the buildings. And yet, the sky is one of the last wildernesses in a kind of urban environment. And for that reason, there's something great about being in a city and looking out, especially if you're in the, at, the, at the top of a high building, then it's a great place to be cloud spotting. You look out, and the sky is the last kind of wildness in this urban environment. Um, so I don't think you have to be in an area of outstanding natural beauty to see an outstandingly beautiful sky and enjoy it and appreciate it. Um, I would... So there are kind of places where the sky is very dramatic. Um, there's a salt lake in Bolivia, the largest salt lake in the world, I believe it is, um, up on a high plateau in Bolivia. And when, it, uh, when you get flash floods there, it gets covered in uh, around about an inch or so of water. Being so shallow, this water can remain very, very still and glass-like, and it's like a mirror. So to be... Standing in the middle of this place, you see the, the sky above you and then the whole sky reflected below you as well. And so you really are like in a kind of, in a kingdom of, of clouds, the sort of thing you imagine when you're a kid, you know, if you go up there, what it would be like if I just jump out of the airplane and just bounce down on this kind of layer of 
strata cumulus or whatever it might be. Um, you know, it's a little bit like that. I haven't been there. That's somewhere I'd like to go. Normally, it involves normally it involves just kind of being somewhere a little bit elevated, a bit of elevation, so that you don't have too much in your way. Um, and then, of course, you, when you're out at sea and there's nothing to look at on the ground, the clouds are an absolute godsend. You know, sailors, that um, embroidered patch that we had there, we've done one for, um, for sailors. There's one for pilots and uh, one for mountain climbers. But the sailors one goes well. But, you know, for, for people who, because that is, that is their view, that, that's their countryside. That's the variety that they get to look at. So anywhere is the answer. I think we've run out of time, guys, but uh, please uh, help me uh, thank Gavin one more time. Appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having me. And I believe he's got...